So thanks so much everyone for joining, especially on this Sunday evening. Uh, my name's Bertie. I'm part of JSO, Just Stop Oil sectional mobilization team. And my work involves bringing together communities with different um, communities in different sections of our society together to connect public issues and the climate crisis. Uh, just to give you a rundown of how tonight's going to go, uh, we're going to be hearing from each of our speakers about their specific field of expertise. And then following this, we're going to move into breakout groups. So you're able to discuss what you've heard and anything else you wish to bring to the table in smaller groups. And then within these breakout groups, we're also going to be discussing in more detail the specific ways to action, um, the specific pathways to action you as individuals and businesses can take following this meeting. Um, we're also going to give you time at the end of your breakout groups to fill in a form letting us know a bit more about you finding out how you might like to get involved and allowing you to be contacted about future events if you have to leave at any point we'd be really grateful if you could fill out one of the forms before you go and we'll pop the link in the chat now so that everyone has access to it um, and we'll also include our JSO website and donation link should you wish to access either one of those so this is our first talk within a series of food related Zoom talks, which are going to include discussions on progressive food businesses, uh, farming talks, veganism talks. Um, we'll share the links to all of these in the chat as well, so you can sign up for these at future dates. Um, but tonight we're going to start the discussion um, in a little bit more of a broad approach to the subject and with some great speakers covering a wide range of areas within the world of food and nature. So as drought has been declared across the UK and Europe, with food prices spiralling and the UK seeing temperatures upwards of 40 degrees, the time for conversations like these has never been more important. So tonight, in our, tonight and in our future talks, we're going to be discussing how climate crisis connects to and impacts the world of food, social farming, veganism, the chain of supply, our ecosystem and natural world, as well as our workplaces and beyond. We're going to be hearing from wildlife expert Chris Packham, co-founder of Animal Rebellion Dan Kidby, Unite the Union Regional Officer Gareth Lowe and JSO spokesperson Tabby Jordan, who's going to end by outlining the demands of JSO and why it's so vital that we start engaging in the conversation and get as many people as possible involved. As JSO builds, it builds to its October coalition where we plan to occupy Westminster. You're going to be hearing more about our October actions from Tabby later on, as well as in the breakout discuss discussions. But in short, it's going to be a full month of planned actions, which we hope will force our government to take notice. We're going to be encouraging specific groups, regions and movements to come together on specific dates to take action. This is going to include wildlife and rewilding days, coalitions with Animal Rebellion, as well as encouraging regional groups to come together and travel to London and to help boost our numbers and get as many people as we can to occupy Westminster. If you want to know more about this or feel you can get involved in any way, please make sure to mention it in your breakout group later and be sure to put this in your personal form also. Ultimately, it's about coming together, connecting and empowering each other to step up. We need to build a mass movement so we can create sustained pressure and force our government to act. But before we go on to discuss this in more detail, we're going to be hearing from tonight's first speaker. So first we have Chris Packham. Chris is a wildlife expert, TV presenter, author and conservationist. He recently joined the JSO National Emergency Zoom talk, which was attended by over 3000 people. And we're really grateful to have him back to talk again tonight. So we'll pass things over to Chris. Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you once again for the invitation to speak briefly this evening. Before I do, I'd like to repeat what I did last time, and that is to take my non-existent hat off to all of those members of Just Stop Oil and other activist groups who are present on the call this evening. The one thing I would really like to reassure you of is that despite some of the public antipathy that you face um, and the problems that you face in your actions, there are a, a determined cohort of us who have enduring and great respect for what you're doing. We really appreciate that you were at the forefront of taking this action and keeping the aims and objectives of Just Stop Oil and others in the media at sometimes great personal cost and personal difficulty. So thank you very, very much. I, I salute every last one of you. Um, I'm gonna start off by telling you how I feel. Um, I feel pretty scared actually. 
Um, when the term eco-anxiety was coined a few years ago, it was not something that I instantly felt an affinity for or that I might ever suffer from, but things have changed. And I don't need to tell any of you, I don't need to barrage you with a raft of statistics this evening um, because of the nature of the people who've joined us on this call. But you all know, as I know, that we are now in deep, deep trouble. And when I say we, speaking as a pragmatic biologist, I don't mean life. Life will survive if we burn every last lump of coal and every drip of oil and gulp of gas. If we reduce the surface of our planet to a hellscape, in a few million years time, it will be beautiful again. When we're talking about protecting the planet at the moment, we're talking principally about protecting it from human impacts at this point in time and the legacy that we carry with us already. I believe we still have the capacity to make good and to survive this period, but we don't find ourselves in a very good position at the moment for the simple reason that we've left it very late to address the problem. Um, that problem has been exacerbated and we're now feeling it with our 40 degrees centigrade, our droughts, not just in the UK. I've just been looking at pictures on the, uh, on the internet of China rivers the size of the Thames down to a trickle in the middle. The impact is being felt all over the world and it will increasingly be felt ever more fiercely, as we know. We find ourselves in a very unfortunate position because we haven't laid in place any significant measures to adapt to this crisis. That's scary. That's again, lack of preparedness. But perhaps most frightening of all is that we find ourselves having elected a collective of governors around the world, not just in the UK, who are clearly not capable of the task which they're now faced with. And that means that it's down to us. And when I say us, I mean the people on this call. You've joined this call because probably like me, you're scared, maybe you're very frightened, you're certainly very concerned, but equally, you perhaps have recognized that you need to do something about it yourself. We need to do it ourselves. And that's what Just Stop Oil's initiative is all about. It's about doing it themselves. And while some sections of society might see those activists as pariahs at the moment, the one thing that I think I can assure you of is that if we have a history, then it will look favorably on all of those who take action at this point to highlight the crisis that we are in. So that's why our bravery is needed more than ever. Equally, it places an enormous burden on our shoulders because we can't trust our leaders to do the right thing We've got sewage pouring into our rivers at a ghastly rate. We've got a cost of living crisis, an energy crisis. We've got so many crises that, frankly, they're fighting for crises news. We've got to do something about it ourselves. Um, and therefore, we need to be effective. Now, there are a lot of effective groups out there. I sat for four hours uh, about a month ago on the M25 when Just Stop Oil were blocking it. Uh, sat there sweltering in my electric car. Electric cars are not the whole answer. I'm not painting myself as some sort of self-righteous saviour. Um, I'm just doing what I can at the moment. So I sat there along with everyone else. And do you know what I thought? Because I was forced to think by those activist actions about the crisis. And I hope that every other person in those tailbacks was thinking the same. And when I got back, I wrote a note of thanks to Just Stop Oil for making me stop and think for four hours. So it was an effective action. Another group that I'm keen to applaud are Animal Rebellion. I like Animal Rebellion very much. And one of the things I like most about them is the clarity of their purpose. There is no ambiguity about their core aim. They want to urgently usher in a transition to plant-based diets around the world. That's what it says on their can. And that's what they're trying to do. And I follow them on Instagram and I'm impressed by their graphics, their infographics. They are clear and they're concise. They're well researched. They're not alarmist. They're factual. And in fact, they're convincing. And that's the key thing. They are convincing. At the moment, they're posting quite a few 
pictures of some of the actions that they're partaking in. But those infographics are absolutely brilliant. And I think that key to our success is that clarity. Just stop oil. Stop exploring for more, paying subsidies to do so, extracting it from the ground and burning it. That's, again, at the core of what Just Stop Oil are about. It says it on the can. And I think that following the webinar that I was invited to take part in a little while back that you, you heard about, um, I was left slightly worried that sometimes we are apt to lose sight of the bigger picture. Now, we all have our individual concerns and motivations. We all sometimes have our environmentally active egos. I'm a conservationist. I love life. I'm disappointed by the you know, scarcity of butterflies this year, the poor numbers of breeding birds of some species. I want to do something about it, but I'm not going to save our world by saving those butterflies. And in the other talk that I attended, there were many people focusing upon very important, let's not have any ambiguity here, lack of equality, racial inequality, lack of shared resources, uh, lack of resilience, all of the things these people were talking about were extremely valid and pertinent when it comes to solving some of the problems that we face. But I think our greater strength is keeping the message clear and simple. And that is that we all need air to breathe, food to eat and water to drink. Above all of those other concerns, unless we act on the large scale, on the bigger picture here, then all of our smaller concerns and sometimes foibles will just fall away and never be realized. And I think that it's really imperative at this point to recognize the extreme urgency of the situation because we now live in a world post COVID where nothing happens fast. It's very difficult to action things quickly. And therefore we need to work ever harder to make sure that our actions work. I think we need to be imaginative in terms of what we do. And again, I would draw upon animal rebellion as exemplars of this. Yes, they take certain actions, but their policy seems to be that they do them for a few times. They get the necessary press and the news and the following and the coverage. They expand their community um, and then they move on to the next thing. And using that imagination is key, I think, to our success. We can't just pull off the same stunts time and time again. So creativity needs to be at the core of, of what we do. And the next thing we need to think about is inclusivity. Now, you can probably imagine what I feel about Brexit. You can probably imagine where my political leanings lie. But when I communicate with those people who follow me, I don't broadcast those because I know that I run the risk of losing, I can't remember what it was, about 49% um, of, of the of people involved in the Brexit vote. I know it's now changed. Um, but ultimately, those people may have a different opinion of me about that particular, particular part of, of, of contemporary politics, but they're the, still the same people that are going to need the same air to breathe, the same food to eat and the same water to drink. So remaining inclusive is really important. Don't burn bridges, build them with those communities. We don't all have to agree about everything other than the fact that we want to survive this crisis. And I want as much other life to survive this crisis. And the key words that I left my last talk with were transition, which again, our animal rebellion embrace, moving from a, a, a method of farming and a method of uh, eating, as we do at the moment, through a transition to a plant-based diet. In order to transition, we need tolerance because that will take time. Not everyone will do that tomorrow. I'm a vegan. Not everyone's going to take that jump tomorrow morning because I or Animal Rebellion asked them to. Tolerance. And lastly, to manifest that tolerance, uh, tolerance, we need kindness. We've got to be kind to one another. And we've got to be kind, especially to those people whose hearts and minds we need to win more desperately than ever. So please, let's keep our messages clear. Please, let's exercise tolerance and kindness. 
And at the core of everything, let's remember that whatever color we are, whatever gender we, 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 we ascribe ourselves to, whatever any of those differences might be there, we are one species on one planet with one last chance to sort it out and we cannot fail. So please, please support Just Stop Oil, support Animal Rebellion, and you'll find that your community will grow. And of course, more and more people like myself will rally to support you too. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing, Chris. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Um, so next, we're gonna be hearing from Gareth Lowe, we're aware that many of you on this call may work within the food industry, whether that's from farming to food venues, health food shops, vegan establishments, restaurants or cafes, or maybe you're part of the chain of supply. However, if you don't work specifically within the food or farming sector, what Gareth has to say is relevant no matter what line of work you're in. Gareth is a regional officer for Unite the Union and also a passionate environmentalist. In his talk, Gareth is going to be making links between, the cl between climate activism and trade unionism, explaining why workers are never to blame and exploring the just element of a just transition. So over to Gareth. Thanks very much, Bertie. Uh, brothers, sisters, siblings, let me start by introducing myself. Uh, I was raised by a conservationist who I think is on this call. Hi, mum. And uh, she would do things like put annoying stickers on the light switch saying this light switch is directly connected to the Earth's dwindling resources and other messaging. And like many people on this call, I learned all about climate change at school. We called it the greenhouse effect then, but it was mostly the same thing. And then I started the world of work and I did nothing really with that information that I had already until a few years ago when I woke up and I realized this is not enough. And I approached my employer. By this point, I had transitioned from working in publishing to working in trade unionism, uh, believing in the power of collectivism. And I said to my employer, what can I do and what can we do as an employer on this agenda. Now, as Bertie says, um, I am no expert on food, although I love eating it. I'm no expert, certainly not compared to Chris, on the uh, nature and the environment, although I love walking and being in it, and I hope we can preserve it. Um, but I do believe that climate change is a trade union issue, and I'm going to try and outline now why that is. I'll also make apologies at this early stage to anybody here who heard me um, speak at Tollpuddle, but I was given a very similar brief, so I'm going to use some of the same material. Unlike Chris, I will waste 30 seconds just to make sure we're all on board with a few stats. Um, we've had five mass extinction events from, 40, uh, from 450 million years ago to the most recent, just 70 million years ago. And each of those have wiped out between 75 and 96% of all species. And yet more than half of the carbon that we have put into the atmosphere has come from the burning of fossil fuels in just the last 30 years. It's very trendy, isn't it, to say, oh, it was the industrial revolution that set us down this path and we couldn't really do anything about it. Well, actually, many of us on the call, it's our very own lifetimes that may have seen irreversible change made. The UN predicts 200 million climate refugees by 2050. Now, of course, refugees should always be welcome here. But wouldn't it be great to live in a world where people didn't have to flee their homes because of the negative impacts of war and climate? And yet less than 100 corporations, I believe now, between them are responsible for more than half of our global carbon emissions. So we do need to look at our industries if we are going to get ourselves out because we could do the rest of this work and it could not be enough. Um, could somebody mute please? Um, people often ask, are we too late? Um, and I don't think the answer is binary. It's not a matter of yes, we are too late or no, we're not, it's a matter of how bad do we want things to get? One thing that is clear is we can't simply leave this to someone else to sort out. Do it yourself, non-violent direct action is a fantastic tactic on that front. Yes, of course, we should lobby COP27, but it's clear to me, we can't leave these decisions to world leaders and expect them to sort out our malaise. 
it's equally clear that we can't just work in silos. We need to talk to one another. And those of us taking that type of action need to make sure we're talking to workers impacted by that type of action so that we are joined up. So how are we going to go about doing this? Well, there are three pillars, I believe, uh, that we need to affect change in if we're going to get ourselves out of this hole. One of those is personal, and I'm not going to insult your intelligence on this call today by telling you how to make changes in your personal lives. In fact, you're all on this call, you know why you're here, and I'm sure you're making that, those decisions. You can use Google, other search engines are available to ensure that you're actually making holistic decisions Download a carbon calculator. Make sure the decisions you're making are actually researched and you are informed. The second pillar is community. We need to make changes in our communities and five years to wait for a general election can feel like a very long time. Um, of course, we can make changes more locally without waiting, but we do need to ensure the decision makers we have in power are actually fit for purpose. And as Chris highlighted, I simply don't believe this Tory government in this country is fit for purpose. And that's why I'm supporting, and many of us in the movement are supporting proportional representation, PR, so that when we do a next elected government, they more closely represent our desires. But all this change could be in vain if we don't change that third pillar. And the third pillar is our workplaces. But change is coming. I live here in Glastonbury and the Glastonbury Festival just down the road this year brought a tear to my eye. And the reason was, as I wandered around site, I realised maybe now more than ever, climate is cool. And that's great. But as we ascend, as this shift in consciousness takes place and we become more aware of what we have done to our planet and what we need to do to get out of the situation, there is an equal and opposite ascension of forces looking to try to protect their own interests. Now, it's very easy, isn't it, to break down employers and personify them and say, this employer is evil or this employer is benevolent. But really, what is an employer? An employer is a group of different individuals all following their own slightly nuanced different interests. For the sake of this call, I will make things a little more binary. Um, and I'll say, let's face it, there are employer concerns and employee concerns. And the two are not always aligned. And that's why I believe trade unions through legislation and what is available to us offer a mechanism for changing that power dynamic and ensuring that employees are heard. It will be one way of avoiding a very different type of PR, and that is public relations, and that comes from greenwashing. Now, I'm sure many of you on this call know all about greenwashing. That is the process of employers saying they're doing the right thing about climate and the environment. But all they're really doing is enough to convince their customer base and ensure that their profits aren't impacted. What I'm talking about here is a route to avoid that and ensure that those companies' credentials are genuine. How are we doing that within my trade union, Unite? Well, we're pushing for unique climate agreements to be signed. These will enshrine the rights for green reps, much as health and safety reps currently have. And again, I know Chris has urged us not to uh, be uh, divisive, but I don't see us getting that from our current government under legislation. So we're going to need to bolster employment law with these type of agreements. They're also demanding a seat and a voice on climate committees, holding companies to task by demanding some transparency around their climate commitments and environmental commitments. And they're not just changing those employers themselves, but they're also enshrining commitments to look up and down the supply chain. And finally, these agreements ensure that our reps in the workplaces are trained, so they have the time to take away from their substantive roles to get informed and to ensure that they know what they're talking about when they get that seat and that vote at the table. It's not enough for companies to simply appoint a director of sustainability and think that that will solve their problem. We know we need to do a lot more than that. I don't know if people on this call saw the Netflix series, The Good Place. I did, and I loved it. And the reason I mention it here today is because it um, demonstrates a problem we have. Uh, the concept of the show, for those who didn't see it, was there was a good place, a heaven, and a bad place, a hell. And where you ended up depended upon a kind of karmic transactional score that you got. But here's the twist. It was impossible to get into the good place. Because even going down to your supermarket and buying some tomatoes 
could be such an unethical transaction that we all end up with a negative points balance. That's why it's essential we change industry if we are going to succeed in this climate struggle. As I say, I'm no expert at food and farming, but what we're talking about here is concepts like agroecology, bringing ecological principles into agriculture. We're talking about concepts like food sovereignty, uh, making healthy, culturally appropriate food available to all, produced through ecologically sustainable models. And this isn't a pipe dream. Those who saw Chris's recent series, Spring Watch, will have seen Wild Ken Hill, where exactly this type of rewilding and regenerative farming is working alongside nature and still turning a profit. And I'm pleased, as a pesky vegan myself, that Chris did the diet bit, but it's important that we are also educated on that agenda. Put simply, we can't keep living as we are. Remember, guys, my talk will be a little political. Um, austerity is a political philosophy at the end of the day. The capacity exists through natural resources, tidal, solar and wind, for us to power our lives and our economy successfully. What we need is the infrastructure to be built around it to harness that capacity. And in part, that requires political will. People ask me, what is a green job? Well, let's be honest, we're not all going to have the luxury of working in cusp green industry, as lovely as that would be. Some of us will have to work in dirtier and more polluting roles. So I think the question is a misnomer. The question should be, how can jobs be greened? And I believe that if we take on the model I'm talking about, all employment can be greened. So Chris mentioned just transition. I'll just expand on that and then I'll finish my uh, address. Um, we all know what transition is, but it's really important to me and to working people that that transition is just. That means having honest conversations and bringing people with us. I'm talking about retraining, I'm talking about reskilling, and where necessary, I'm talking about redundancy as well. These conversations need to be adult and they need to be grown up. If we're going to cease our dependence on oil, we need to change some roles. My message then to you, take part in the breakout areas today. Take away from this what you can. If you are a trade unionist, look to change trade union policy. Some of it is compromised because it's supporting workers in polluting industries. But ultimately, I believe that collectivism is the answer to our eco anxieties that Chris talked about earlier. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Gareth. Um, anyone wanting to learn a bit more about Gareth's work um, or get in touch with Gareth, we'll put his contact details in the chat so that you can all see those. But thank you so much for sharing. Uh, next, we're going to be hearing from Dan Kidby. Dan is working towards transformative change at the intersection of climate and animal issues. He is the co-founder of Animal Rebellion and also Narrative Shift. So I'll pass things over to Dan. Hi everyone, it's an absolute honour to be speaking here today and um, thanks for the invitation and thanks to Chris Packham as well for the very kind words about our work at Animal Rebellion. Um, so I'm so happy that this talk on food and farming has been organised because the environmental movement for the last like 30 years has been on the whole focused on fossil fuels. And of course, it's incredibly important to transition away from fossil fuels and I don't want anything that I say to be taken as a denial of that absolute imperative. Um, but it is far from a, far from a crucial task, uh, a simple task, sorry. And transforming our food system is absolutely central and a crucial component of this transition. Now, this is a complex argument which doesn't really neatly fit on an infographic, but I hope to make it simple for you tonight. Um, so James Hansen, uh, chief scientist of NASA, uh, referred to coming off fossil fuels as the Faustian bargain or otherwise known as the deal with the devil, um, selling your soul to the devil. And the reason why he said this is because coming off fossil fuels, if not done right, will lead to irreversible climate tipping points. And I know that this is counterintuitive, so I want to explain why this is. And it's because when you burn fossil fuels, you do not only emit carbon dioxide, but you emit a whole range of other gases as well. And one of those gases, um, in particular, and the crucial one, is sulfur dioxide. Um, now, while carbon dioxide warms the planet, sulfur dioxide actually has a cooling effect. And while carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for around 1,000 years, sulfur dioxide stays for around 20 years in our atmosphere. 
So what this means is that if we were to actually stop burning fossil fuels tomorrow, in 20 years time, we would lose the cooling effect of sulfur dioxide, which would have the effect of pushing us over 1.5 and towards two degrees of warming, risking total climate collapse, as we all know. And this phenomenon is known as global dimming. So what the hell do we do about that then? Uh, well, broadly, it means that we have to be very clever about how we come off fossil fuels. And actually we have to have a phased transition off of fossil fuels, doing other things to make the transition possible. And we have to do what one scientist has called a systems engineering approach. So in order to, to make it possible to come off fossil fuels, we have to do two key things. And both of these things are directly and intimately related to animal farming and fishing. So first, methane reduction. The thing about methane is that like sulfur dioxide, it only stays in the atmosphere for a short period of time, around 20 years or so. And the warming from methane roughly equals the cooling from sulfur dioxide. Um, so what people are saying basically is that we have to stop emitting methane in order to balance out the loss of cooling from sulfur dioxide so that we can safely come off fossil fuels. And this is why like at the IPCC, um, you're having them saying that like one of our first things we have to do is just rapidly lower methane. This is the reason why. Um, and like lead review of the IPCC, there would say, okay, I don't know how to pronounce that, says like cutting methane is the biggest opportunity to slow warming between now and 2040. And of course, animal farming is the leading cause of methane. It's responsible for 32% globally and 40%, 47% of UK methane in the UK uh, comes from the agricultural sector. Now, the second thing that we have to do in order to make it possible to come off fossil fuels as part of this phase transition is to implement an, a uh, rapid uh, program of carbon drawdown. So drawing down carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So what is the best way to do that? Um, well, in 2019, strangely, for the first time in history, it took them to get to 2019 to do this, the UN brought together the top scientists from the IPCC working on the climate issues and from the IPBES working on biodiversity issues. These are the top scientists working on mass extinction, the top scientists working on climate. And they asked them, how is it that we reduce our emissions, draw down carbon dioxide and restore ecosystems without causing more problems? Because the thing is, there are climate solutions which can harm nature and there are nature solutions which can harm the climate. So the real key thing is to find the solution that benefits both and doesn't make one of those problems worse. And so when scientists from these two disciplines came together, what they said is that the most important thing that we can do to get out, get out of this crisis is to implement nature-based solutions. Meaning what we need to do is to rewild land and ocean ecosystems, restoring uh, the wetlands, the forests, the peatlands, the natural grasslands, enabling the return of badgers, foxes, hedgehogs, bees to the UK uh, landscape, and also enabling the restoration of oceans, enabling the fish to come back, which brings with it the broader range of ecosystems and like particularly the, phy the phytoplankton, who draw down masses amount of carbon dioxide is often it's very it's very uh, undiscussed how much potential for drawdown the oceans have we all know about the forests but the oceans are a massive lung of they're one of the lungs of our planet the oceans um, and in this report of these top scientists from the IPCC and the IPBES they said that the fundamental barrier to doing this rewilding program was animal farming and fishing. I said that was the thing standing in the way. Fishing, because of course, it's taking out all these fish out of the ocean, driving us to by 2048 fishless oceans. And farming, because it takes up so much land. Animal farming takes up so much land. And which, yes, yeah, so it's land use, which George Monbiot says is the most important environmental metric of all. Um, so um, scientists at Oxford University did the biggest study in history on food systems and the connection to the environmental issues. They looked at over 40,000 farms and they found that if we transition to a plant-based food system, we can reduce our land use globally by 76%. That's the size of the United States, Australia, China and Europe combined. And all of this land can be returned back to nature. 
And on discovering this, the lead author, Joseph Poor, went vegan, just did it overnight. Um, a study by Harvard University found that if in the UK we will return the 50% of agricultural land currently used for animal farming to nature, the UK could feed everyone in this country, be self-sustainable in food, whilst also being net negative in emissions. We could draw down more than we, than we emit and whilst also restoring wildlife and ending in this country the mass extinction crisis. Do all of that in one fell swoop. And another study has found that if we do this transition to a plant-based food system globally, we can draw down as much carbon dioxide as was emitted by fossil fuels in the last 16 years. Now, often people speak about animal farming and fishing because of the problems that it causes. Like we know it's the leading cause of species extinction, habitat destruction, ocean dead zones, water pollution, ocean acidification, eutrophication, and it's a leading cause, or one of the leading causes of emissions. But when we talk about this issue in terms of the problems that it causes, we actually uh, lose out on so much of the picture because why the transition to a plant-based food system is so important is because of the opportunity that it provides. It's the opportunity cost of what we could be doing with the land and what we could be doing with the, with the oceans. And when we look at it from that lens, what we see is that this is the key solution to the climate and nature, nature crises and the best hope that we have for a livable future and the only way to actually be able to come off from fossil fuels in a safe way. So this is what Animal Rebellion brings to the table. Um, we set up in 2019 because basically the entire environmental movement was too scared to bring this message because it was so politically unpopular. Politicians were avoiding it, the NGOs were avoiding it, even the grassroots social movements were, were avoiding it. But we recognized that this couldn't be ignored because if we ignored it, then we were all fucked. Fortunately, that is beginning to change. And I think this call is an, is an exemplary way. You know, all, all three speakers on this issue, uh, on food and farming share this issue. The environmental movement is shifting. And that's amazing. I kind of view Animal Rebellion just open the door for, to make it safe for everyone else. That was our job. And I think we, we've done that quite well. Um, and uh, we also came through because actually on a deeper level, we recognize that we can't properly deal with the climate and nature crisis without properly confronting our relationship to nature. And nothing better symbolizes the way that humans have absolutely dominated nature than what happens on animal farms and fishing vessels. The torture, the mutilation, the killing of billions of land animals and trillions of marine animals is almost too much to bear. Not to mention the complete disregard of the, for the individual animals living in the wild. Uh, at Animal Rebellion, we are clear that if we are to have a future, it must be one where we live in right relationship to nature, to animals, to each other, and to ourselves. We are animals, and we need to remember that. And finally, um, we're based in the uh, idea that actually, in order to bring about change, we must not simply go after the most popular or achievable aim. We must, we must rather go right to the heart of the conflict and make a constructive and kind cultural challenge to society at the level of its core values. So whilst we absolutely fully support Just Stop Oil and its very smart strategy of going to get that wind, which will galvanize the movement and galvanize civil resistance to bring about change, we think that the role we play in Animal Rebellion is to really uh, go to the heart of the conflicts to go to the issue that people eat food three times a day and, and try and create that shift at that deeper level. Um, and we think that actually going to the thing that people most don't wanna talk about, that's where the real key change is gonna come from. Um, and because we have to change everything, our entire society has to change. And that includes the things that people don't want to change and the public need to understand that. So as a movement, we have to, I believe, tackle the two big giants, fossil fuels and animal farming and fishing. So in that light, Animal Rebellion have been organizing mass civil resistance. And this September, hundreds of people will be going to shut down the supply of dairy, making it such that there'll be no milk on the supermarket shelves for a one to two week period. 
even if it means for those individuals taking part in the blockade, making the sacrifice of getting arrested on multiple occasions. We will create such a drama and foster such attention that the general public have to recognize the need for government to urgently, one, support farmers, that's really crucial, support farmers. You know, it's like that just transition Gareth was talking about. Um, support them to transition away from animal farming and fishing towards plant-based food production and other sustainable land use practices. And to rewild the freed up land and ocean ecosystems, rewild it intelligently, I might add, um, to enable wildlife to return and carbon to be drawn down. So I invite you to join us. It's going to be completely historic and it's gonna bust up bust open this entire issue and shift the Overton window and pressure change. And if you can't join us, I will ask you to dig deep as much as you can, either by one-off donations or monthly donations. Um, and there'll be links coming in the chat of how you can get involved and how you can donate as well. And I'll fi finish off by saying that in solidarity with Just Stop Oil, we are in rebellion for life. And that as a movement, we will be successful if we have a deep and unwavering commitment to nonviolence. Not only because it's strategically more effective, um, but because we are setting out to create a nonviolent society. And you only build a nonviolent society through nonviolent means. You can only create it through the healing power of love and kindness. And that infuses everything that we do within animal rebellion. Um, and I believe it's infusing the broader environmental movements for life as well. Um, so thank you very much and look forward to the breakouts. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, we've popped the links that you mentioned into the chat. Um, and then also worth mentioning here that JSO are gonna be hosting a vegan specific talk on October 8th, where we're gonna be hearing from vegan activists and animal rights experts and learning uh, more deeply about the beneficial impact of plant-based choices. Um, and what we can do to change um, the climate emergency or respond to the climate crisis. Um, so we'll put the link for that in the chat as well, should anyone want to join that. So finally tonight, before we break into our breakout groups, um, we're gonna be hearing from Tabby Jordan. Tabby, 21, was studying history of art at Glasgow Uni before dropping out to work for JSO full time. She now works on mobilizing our society to take action against the climate crisis and is going to be explaining exactly who JSO are, what we do, why it's so vital and a little bit about her personal journey so far with JSO. So um, I'll pass things over to Tabby and then we'll move into our breakout groups after that. Thanks, everyone. Um, thank you so much, everyone, um, for coming here tonight. Thank you, Dan and Gareth and Chris and Bertie for hosting and editing the tech and um yeah thanks to Dan for just being about animal rebellion like we're not uh <laughs> against each other we're certainly fighting the same fight so and um like um I'll speak a bit more in a minute about how uh connection to animals and nature brought me here but first I want to say like I am I, I'm here because I do believe that non-violent disruption and continued civil resistance is our only and um best hope of mitigating the, the most terrible situation that we find ourselves in and avoiding the worst of all outcomes because we aim to create um, and we are going to create a national crisis and conversation we will put material pressure on our government and we hope this will lead to a win um, of our demand which will inspire a much much greater resistance and achieve the systemic change that we know we all need um, and please do stay for the small groups if you can because the this information and the situation we find ourselves in is so overwhelming um, and we want to run, um, but I think we need to get together and talk about it and share our, our pain to actually be able to do something about it. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll explain a bit about how I came to, to this position and why I'm here. I went um, vegetarian when I was very young, um, eight years old, I didn't know anyone vegetarian or, um, yeah, I, I I didn't I wasn't super aware of I was and no one told me you know about it. It just it came to me and I think I was just I just became increasingly overwhelmed by the violence, uh, the terrible terrible things we did to farm animals, and I felt so powerless to change it because I was a child um, and I was I was angry and I'm vegan now um, because I realised dairy is just as violent and um, as meat. 
and but then as I got older I, I my awareness of what we were doing expanded to what we had done to the natural world more widely um and Extinction Rebellion brought my attention to the future that we now face. Um, and I, I, I also don't want to talk about loads of facts and figures, but I will just talk about one paper, which I think just illustrates um, where we're headed, because I do think it's important to touch base, even if we feel like we've heard this information loads of times. And it's a paper called The Future of the Human Climate Niche. And it says that two degrees warming, which is where we're headed, um, 1,000 million people, 1 billion people will have, and this is just this is just heat, by the way, this isn't all the other um, things that will displace people. 1 billion people at two degrees will have to leave where they live or die. We'll have to leave where they've lived for thousands of years. But I just feel like I wasn't told like what this means for too long. I, I wasn't given it, I didn't feel like I was told it really straight for too long and it, it it, what it means is obviously people don't just get up and, and leave and, and have to leave where they live um, qu quietly. You know, there will be so much death. You know, you know this, but I think it's important to try and connect to it, to the, to the amount of suffering that is obviously already happened, but it's going to get so much worse um, through mass war and mass starvation and just unimaginable violence. And this is just at two degrees and um, amongst other things like. Um, Dan spoke about but if we don't stop emitting carbon um, we will see higher and higher temperatures and more suffering and that's why we're hosting this meeting and you know the former chief scientific advisor to the UK government um, Sir David King said at a conference in Australia last year that what he um, he believed that we need to move rapidly and what we do in the next three to four years will determine the future of humanity and to engage with this, it does make you feel, well, it makes me feel insane. Um, and when you have this, like, you know, what we do to animals, what we do to nature, what we do to each other, when, when it makes you feel mad. Um, but if you do feel like that, you're not mad, you're not insane. It is our government who is continuing to try and license new fossil fuel infrastructure that is insane. Um, we have over five years left of oil reserves without drilling for new oil, and we do need to rapidly transition now. And it's obscene. What they're doing is obscene. We're not acting like it. And I feel that we have failed so far as a movement to, oh, I, no, we have failed in creating the systemic change we need. But, the, and, and this situation we find ourselves in is not our fault. It's not, we haven't caused this. But now, sitting here in 2022, in this room, in this Zoom room, it's, I believe it's no one's responsibility but our own to prevent the worst case scenario of this. This, this activism, whatever you want to call it, it is not a passion, it's, it's not a hobby. I'm not passionate about about nature, about defending life. We, we are nature, we are nature. And, and like Chris said, we're not going to destroy all of life, all of nature. Life will, will continue beyond, beyond but, but what, we will, what we will destroy is ourselves. And, and like I said, when I realized about what we do to animals when I was little, um, I felt really powerless and I was, but now I'm not a child and we are not powerless. And I hate it when people say, oh, you shouldn't have to do this. Like, <laughs> like we have a choice. We do this or, or we'll die. That's what's happening. That's where we are. And yeah, so, so what are we gonna do? I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here tonight. I wouldn't, we wouldn't host these meetings if, I didn't think, if we didn't think we could change our situation, if we still have time to mitigate our situation. And so I'm inviting you to occupy Westminster from the 1st of October um, and join the We All Want to Just Stop Oil Coalition. And I'll explain a little bit about it. It's not gonna be go down and do a march and go home back to normal life. 
what we're trying to what we're trying to create here is a whole different thing it's it's resistance it's resistance to death to the destruction of what we love and we're not going to stop we're not going to stop until we get the government to agree to the most basic thing which is to not license new fossil fuel projects and i believe we can we are uh, building the collective power we need to pressure our government and I actually think it's because of the scale and how overwhelming and how existential what we're facing is that we can come together on this and do something about it and I'm seeing it happening we're having 50 to 100 meetings a week in towns and um, cities all over the country and huge meetings like this um, like the one last week a couple of weeks we had 2,000 people on it and people are getting it People are getting that it's the end of the world and that we need to come together and we are. And there's so many different examples I could go through with the power of, of direct action, but I mean, I don't have time, but people are angry. People are really angry. People are not just angry about the destruction of a livable climate, but they're also angry about the fact that they can't pay their bills and that the rich in society are getting richer and richer. And they see, they see the insanity. And so from the 1st of um, October, there's going to be a huge march with various trade union partners and many other groups. And then also starting on that day is a different campaign, not ours, but it's called the Don't Pay campaign. And people are going to be refusing to pay their energy bills. And we are, after this march, going to be blockading Westminster and the roads around it day after day after day. And people are going to get arrested and we're going to keep coming back and thousands of people are going to be engaging in civil disobedience with the demand of no new oil. And we're not going to stop. Like I said, we're not going to stop. And we're not asking anymore. We're not asking. We're going to have to make them. And this is the biggest chance, I believe, that we've had for a long time to create, um, to force government change. And I believe this is a pivotal, will be a pivotal moment for humanity. And it's going ahead anyway. It's going to happen. Um, but whether it's successful does depend on what we do tonight, what we, um, what we do in the breakout groups and what we do in the next few months. So I urge you to sign up in whatever way you can and join Occupy Westminster and Just Stop Oil Coalition. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for sharing, Tabby. Um, a few people in the chat are asking about a couple of the references, um, the talks that you mentioned. Um, so if you have the capacity to share those with me, I can share them with everyone else. Um, so if you give us a couple of minutes, we're going to put everyone into breakout groups from here. I want to thank all of our speakers again tonight. I feel like it was a really um, broad view on the subject and we have many more talks like we've mentioned before, as well as animal rebellion talks coming up. So please do join those. It is so important that we engage in these conversations and all the conversations to come in the future. Um, in your breakout groups, you'll have the chance to discuss in smaller groups. Anyone that can't stay, please fill out the form that was popped into the chat earlier um, otherwise feel free to join the breakout groups and then we'll be meeting again at the end um, so yeah be patient with us while we put you into your groups um, and otherwise have a lovely evening and thank you again to all of our speakers